Broadcasting from Great Gate Studios, it's time for Connected with Lori. Tune in every other Wednesday to learn about the future innovation of technology and advanced tech trends. Here is your host, Lori Caruso. Hello and welcome to Connected with Lori. I am your host, Lori Caruso. On our show, we talk about the future innovations of technology. And in order to have the technology that we need today, we need to be able to have the backbone and the backhaul and fiber to be able to have these networks operate successfully. I am so excited to welcome my guest, Andy Pentley from Zenfi Networks here today on the podcast show. Hi, Andy. Hi, Lori. How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you? Fantastic. A little crazy. Usually I see you at events and I haven't seen you in almost a year. It's crazy, right? I know, right? It is crazy. It is. So talk to us a little bit about ZenFi and what you're doing today. Let's hear about that. Sure, sure. Uh, ZenFi uh, Networks is a uh, mobile infrastructure company. The company was started in 2000, late 2013 and, and uh, really operational in 2014, but the owners and founders of ZenFi Networks had previously owned and operated a legacy fiber company, Lex in uh, New York City. And when they, when they looked at what they were going to do next, they, they wanted to solve for a specific problem, which was mobile densification. You know, wire, wireless needs lots of wires. They all say that, right? But, um, you know, what they foresaw and what's come to fruition is, you know, a really dense deployment of transmission points, of antennas throughout, especially in ultra dense networks like New York City. And so they engineered a very specific cable technology to be able to uh, do something legacy fiber networks can do, which is drop a pair anywhere along the network without having to overbuild. And there, in uh, 2014, they, they, we started a project where we are providing the underlying infrastructure for Link NYC, which is the, tele, the kiosk program in New York City for payphone, payphone replacements. And um, we, we started building that network and we, we built a lot of capacity into that network to support the mobile operators. So uh, in that time, we've also merged with a company from New Jersey to sort of expand our, our footprint uh, out into Northern New Jersey. Uh, we have about, at the end of this year, I think we'll have about 1,350 route miles of, of high capacity, highly accessible network and thousands of vertical siding locations throughout the city for, um, for small cell deployments in the right of way. Wow, Andy, that's incredible. You know, you're obviously expanding for sure. Tell us why it is so important to have fiber. Um, it, it's, 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 it's important to have fiber and it's important to have highly accessible fiber and it's important to have a ton of capacity, right? As you see these, the carriers expand into these, um, in the spectrum and these bands where they have a ton of contiguous spectrum, uh, you know, there, you have to have transmission cables enough to accommodate all this additional bandwidth that created through this new spectrum, right? So, and, and the other thing is, you know, in order to hit their, their goals, the 5G standards, they're going to deploy really, really densely. And you want to have dedicated fiber connections to each one of these densely deployed antenna locations in the right of way and enterprise locations, venues, you know, when you think about the number of radios we all know are going in right now, the number of transmission points, there's no better way to connect those, right? No faster way to connect them than through fiber optic networks. So, yeah, there's no question about that. And, you know, I'm really curious because when I, um, you know, do my installation uh, of sorts in buildings, you know, I, I only have to worry about the building itself, but I have to make sure that I have backhaul to the building to be able to have my systems, my DAS networks light up. That's the only way we can do that. And I know that it's challenging because it takes time, it takes cost, but how does ZenFi help the property owner? And I know you're in New York City, New Jersey and growing, but how does it help? How do you guys help the building owner in the cities? We have a lot of relationships with the, with the REITs and uh, also with the actual operators of the buildings in New York City. And there's been a lot of projects, really large projects uh, in building or uh, campus type projects or aggregation of several um, buildings where we worked with our partners. We came in in a very consultative nature, uh, brought in, you know, looked at what their problem was, brought what we the right partner for them was in and worked collaboratively with them to develop some really good solutions. And I'm really curious too. I mean, obviously in the metropolitan areas, you're running all this cable, all this fiber underneath the, the streets. 
and underneath the buildings and deployment. What happens if there's an area where you might not have fiber to the building? What do you do? Do you just start installing fiber? But how do you work that? How do you do something like that? It's a really complex process in New York City, especially um, in Manhattan and the Bronx, you have a very old uh, conduit system called the ECS. And then, and of course, out in the boroughs, you have um, you anything that's in a conduit system is in the LEC conduit system, uh, which is Verizon's the LEC in that market. But there's also existing conduits going into the building. So the first step we would look at is to license an existing conduit, right? The, the LEC is obligated to license conduits if there's additional capacity. Uh, where you start getting really expensive is the next step, right? When you don't have that that existing pathway from the ECS system into the building, you, you have to dig, right? And, and so creating conduit in the right of way in Manhattan can cost $200 a foot. And that's without special restoration and you know uh, decorative sidewalks and all these other things. So the pathway for fiber into a building can it is essential to the commercial viability of a lot of projects. You know, if, if there's not existing pathways, then a lot of times it drives the viability out of these projects and it, it makes it a real challenge to build a DAS uh, in an enterprise building. Wow, you know, when a building owner tell, is being told their tenants absolutely need to have coverage and they're not going to move in, and then the building owner takes the next step and says, I'm going to build infrastructure for my people. I think this is great. We've you know raised the capital. We're able to do it. But then they find out they can't get the network to the building to be able to operate and turn it on. That's a challenge for sure. What other challenges do property owners in New York City face as well for technology? You know what I've seen is um, also it's sort of along the same lines of what you were just discussing, where property owners are trying to take the right next step to deliver better uh, better communications inside their building, but maybe they're not uh, you know they don't have the experience and wherewithal to know exactly what they should be doing. So we've seen, for instance, you know um, very recently we saw where a what would you would expect to be a um, pretty experienced property owner they 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 operate a lot of property in New York City's. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they did build that conduit coming from the building out to the right of way, but they didn't connect it to anything. So they built a conduit into a manhole out in the right of way, but the right of way was sitting on an island. So, you know, that's one thing is to really have a lot of forethought and maybe work with some companies like Zenfi or, or, or others um, in the advanced stages, right? Early in the planning stages to sort of figure out from the start, hey, this is what you should watch out for. This is what you want to do. You want to be careful of this, that kind of thing. So I always get on my soapbox. It's all about strategy and property owners need to know that there has to be a strategy and they don't necessarily want to start that strategy three months, six months when they are thinking a deployment. They need to start thinking about strategy in a year. It takes a yes. long time. And, and I see that and there's always a gotcha. I mean, even with public safety infrastructure with what I do and I consult with, we still need to be able to have that backbone to be able to do what we need it to do. And when they're building new construction, we're hoping, we're hoping that the architects, the proper, the, the uh, management companies, everybody has that piece, but falls short we find, and then it's too late. So the strategy is critical, wouldn't you agree? I, I would. I would. I think um, I think you should be planning for networks you're going to build in a year or two. I definitely agree with that part. You know, uh, there's a lot of opportunity to look at different solutions. You know, Zenfi deploys a CRAN network, right? We have we have the front hall fiber you're talking about going to pretty densely deployed um, mobile edge data centers. And then from there going, you know, back haul back to the command and control for the carriers. So we've seen been able to drive a lot of uh, efficiencies, both operationally and commercially, into the utilization of our infrastructure uh, to, to aggregate at these small network hubs. And, and the way it helps a lot of property owners is, you know, their real estate, you know, you look at A buildings in Manhattan or, or, or you know, the really high end real estate, it's, it's, it's really valuable for them uh, to be sort of wasting on uh, putting a, a head in, right? And, and the other thing I think that they don't know ahead of time is, uh, the power and cooling to operate a large uh, system is very significant, right? So the, you know, I, I heard a stat one time, a company was working at a major 
uh, department store about two years ago, and they came to us about a CRAM solution about utilizing our hubs. And the reason they did was because uh, just the hard infrastructure for the head-end space was going to be about um, $1,500 a square foot. So they needed 1,000 square feet. So, you know, I don't know that everybody calculates that cost in when they first start, right? And, and it's pretty material. So I agree with you again, strategy, 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 to get, get way out in front of this thing, plan for what you're going to do in a year or two, and really consider all your options. You don't have to give up your real estate. There are some real um, efficiencies around CRAM solutions. And I would urge anybody that's going to make a significant investment, and has, especially if you have multiple properties, to really consider whether that would be the right solution for you. Absolutely. There are consultants out there to help and support for sure. Definitely, definitely do some homework there. So Andy, I have so many more questions about what ZenFi is doing for future and some of the products that you guys have going on. I'm going to take a short break though first, and we'll be right back after these messages. Montgomery Technologies specializes in riser management for commercial office buildings. Montgomery's award-winning riser services are provided at no cost to the building and include 24 by 7 by 365 access screening, cable management, enhanced tenant services, and liability protection. They manage hundreds of commercial office buildings nationwide and would welcome the opportunity to add their comprehensive suite of services to your building or portfolio. Montgomery encourages you to discover how their no-cost service can generate net new building revenue, reduce COPEX and OPEX, and ensure all cabling is run to building and industry standards. With no cost to the building, there is nothing to lose. Give Montgomery a try and experience the service and support that professional comprehensive riser management provides. Hello and welcome back to Connected with Lori. Andy from ZenFi is here. We're just going over some really important pieces to what ZenFi is doing in the future of where we're going to put fiber and how are we going to do what we need to do to drive in the future with all the technology that we have that is existing. And one of the big topics that I'm super curious about is co-location. Co-location, I feel, is critical because there's only so much space, so many assets. How are you working to go to the future with co-location and are your partners getting along there? I'm curious. So I agree with you, right? There's a finite amount of assets, physical assets, uh, especially in the right of way where we can uh, co-locate uh, antennas, radios, fiber cables. So it's really essential uh, co the carriers do not have enough capital to deploy the networks that be required for 5G without co-location, right? That's a fact. Um, so ZenFi is working with municipalities throughout the region, um, you know, one very large municipality that's in the region uh, to look at co-location opportunities. Um, you know, and the, the other mobile telecom franchises have worked together to explore uh, different uh, co-location solutions for the city. Some of the I think some of the struggles we run into are, you know, a lot of the a lot of siding in the right of way is done on existing city-owned assets or utility-owned assets such as poles, right? And the poles are aging, and they require a lot of modifications and um, can be very capital-intensive. So, you know, the numbers to deploy a single small cell on an existing pole in New York City are staggering. Um, you know, for five of them, you could build a, a large in-building pass. So. Uh, I think that what we have to get to are purpose-built structures in the right of way that support mobile densification that can accommodate multiple carriers, not just two, right? We need three to four carriers in these locations. And that's how we bridge the digital divide. That's how we get broadband for all in these, in these UDNs is we leverage purpose-built mobile densification structures. Uh, and, and they have to accommodate 5G, right? Especially the carriers that want to use millimeter and UDNs. The form factor, if you look at New York City, for example, uh, they, they had a mobile telecom franchise that started, that was authorized in 2004. At the time, everybody was deploying uh, ions, right? These big, long ions. You, so they designed everything around being able to fit two ions in a box and put a whip on top, and there's your solution. And that, that resolution uh, was authorized for 15 years. So for 15 years, you know, within five years, everybody knew we needed something different. 
And then for the last 10 years, we all tried to fit, uh, you know, a round peg in a square hole. So, you know, now with the, with the millimeter wave and we want the transmitter to be integrated with the antenna, right? These form factors for these radios can get pretty large. Uh, one of the three big OEMs released uh, a new product line recently and the heat sinks are that, are that big, right? So if you want three of those, you know, at a rad center where you can get line of sight for a reasonable distance, uh, these, are, these are larger structures. And, you know, there has to be some trade-offs here between, hey, I don't want the aesthetic pollution, but, you know, we need this connectivity, right? You know, even if, if I know you're very heavily involved in, in public safety and, and boy, how much are we enhancing the public safety networks right now with adding all this capacity and technology and, and capability. So, you know, we've got to look at allowing uh, purpose-built uh, multi-tenant solutions uh, we've got to look at form factors that, that support today's technology and, and let's not shrink wrap it, right? Let's support today's technology and, and a couple more evolutions before we have to go back to the, to the well. And, and we need the, the public private partnership along with the carriers, the, the neutral host providers. We all need to get in sync and know that it's in everybody's best interest to sort of take the next step. And, and you know, I think I, I think if we could get to that point, the, the next evolution would be spectral sharing, right? Like, you know, we we started out, everybody owns their own towers. And then we moved to, you know, they recognized they didn't all want to build their own towers, but they all wanted their own cables. Now they started co-locating on the cables. We're seeing some small cell uh, siding co-location now where, where, where they're pushed into it. I mean, you know, the obvious evolution here with, with these democratized spectrums being made available is spectral sharing, right? We're picking up bandwidth on a single radio. So uh, that's where Zen 5 sees the future and we're building an infrastructure to, to support it. And everybody has to get along, right? Everybody has to get along, Lori. It's really important. We need to all be one big happy team here to be able to get the structure built so we can then succeed in the future for technology. And I used to 100%. see co-location has, it's not new. I mean, it's been, I've been working on co-location back in the nineties when we were deploying cellular in rural markets because it was so expensive. And we were saying, I'm looking at a monopole. I'm looking at a pole. Why can't I use that? I need that asset right there. And, you know, because of risk and because people didn't want anybody touching their asset, we weren't able to deploy the network like we should. So now you might drive down the highway and you see two cellular towers right next to each other rather than let's, we should have used the one pole. It would have looked much nicer, but the same thing goes in the city. We don't want, we don't want to have all these unnecessary monopoles everywhere just because somebody isn't letting them partner. That's right. That's exactly right. Right. I mean, and you know, sometimes the carriers, they'll, they, they have some valid concerns, right. Such as noise and, and things like this, right. And, and you know, here in antenna, we're going to have some noise, but you know, if you look at the, the trade-offs there from a CapEx perspective, especially, right, where you see carriers trying to have less debt. And, you know, we one of the major MNOs wants to have less debt when I'm highly focused on uh, reducing their OPEX right now, right? These are all things that are in the public purview. You know, the way you do that is to co-locate, right? And, you know, if you have to raise your noise floor a little and it shrinks your coverage area a tiny bit, boy, the, the, the CapEx savings though on that and the OPEX savings would allow you to de deploy more, de more densely and still have huge savings, right? So we, there's gonna have to be some trade-offs and it can't be, I check a box and I say, I'm just not gonna do this. We really gotta start looking at it from a, from a what's really viable, from a, from a commercial viability, from a community uh, acceptance vibe, uh, perspective. And, and we gotta move to work co-location and, and sharing of assets within the site as well as the site itself. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, you're right. If there's a noise issue, then clearly there might be other alternatives to doing so um, if co-location yeah. is not the, the method there. So Andy, talk to me. I know we're hearing 5G constantly and the crowds are a little nervous when it comes to concerns about safety. How are you guys getting along and how are you answering those questions from the crowds? Um, so that, that, that is a big concern, right? We see the communities talk about it. Then when we go in for municipal consents and things like that, there's lots of questions around it. I, I would point out that, you know, the heart, the, the, what makes millimeters so difficult to utilize 
is that it will not penetrate anything, right? Uh, it, 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 it won't penetrate anything, including the dermis, uh, your skin. <laughs> so, and, and the rest of the technology been around for 5G is, uh, is sub six. It's mostly it's frequencies we've been using for other applications uh, for a really long time, right? So, you know, I, the, um, the perception that this is, you know, that this is, you know, a, an incremental health risk is it, tough to fight. Uh, we try to put with facts, right? We we are patient. Uh, we pull together facts. Uh, I recently um, had a blog on the WIA website, uh, sort of speaking to the concerns we've seen from the communities and and sort of uh, answering the questions they have. And I think you know it's it's a it's a natural, rational thing to see something new and to to hear words you know radiating and things like that and to have some concerns. And I think it's the responsibility of the neutral choice providers. In the industry as a whole to be patient and to answer the questions but i also think it's fair to have an expectation that the public is going to listen to fact and make fact-based decisions and and uh and see what's best for the community from holistically right you know it's it's a fact that uh you know 5g is going to have a tremendous impact on the worldwide gdp there's lots of stats around communities where you know, uh, how having fiber connectivity influences um, local economies. The same networks that are gonna be made commercially viable to build because of mobile densification will serve education, hospitals, uh, uh, you know, gaming, everything else, right? So we won't just use this fiber connectivity we're building, we'll overbuild it, we'll support the carriers. We'll also support lots of other commercial endeavors that will grow economies, that will, um, you know, will create new technology. So, you know, you really got to educate yourself if there really is an issue there and not just be concerned for the sake of being concerned. Well, and I'm glad you're at, you're answering that because I know, you know, clearly it is a concern for most. And, you know, with growth, there comes growing pains. And this would be considered a growing pain because people are not used to it. And there's a lot of unknowns around it. So as long as it's being addressed, which you're doing, which I, I give you a lot of kudos for that, because it needs to be addressed rather than looked away. And I think the more communication we have around that and the health concerns that exist potentially, that we need to be able to communicate that on why it doesn't exist. So so I appreciate that. I appreciate that for sure. So Andy, my question for you, obviously with this pandemic, I always ask the question on my podcast, what was your pandemic pivot? It can be personal. It can be for business. I know you just had a little one. So a lot of changes at your house, but I'm super curious. What are you doing today that you were not doing before the pandemic? Yeah. So I do have a little one. I have a 10 month old. Congratulations. And, um, you know, I, I thank you. And I, I think uh, probably in 2018, uh, 2019, I probably traveled, you know, 20, 25 weeks a year, half the year I was out of town. I've certainly got to spend a lot more time with my child if there is a silver lining. Um, Zen5, we went remote uh, the second week in March and we still are. And what we found is that we're very impressed with ourselves and our teams. So, um, you know, we didn't miss a beat. Like these guys, especially, you know, guys like me, it's not that hard, but you you look at the ops guys and uh, all remote except for the technicians and they have not missed a beat. They, they've maintained through the pandemic, even though, you know, municipalities were shutting down and they couldn't get in touch with anybody. These guys are still out there building network. Uh, they're still filling customer orders. That, you know, if anything, we, we've increased, right, due to capacity demands. So, they, they didn't miss a beat uh, working remote. We're still remote right now. Uh, we will start looking at some options to bring people in, uh, you know, maybe have A and B teams or, or days a week or something like that. But I've been very impressed with our teams. Well, it's great to hear. And I know clearly with the pandemic and what we can't do, we don't have studios anymore. If we're doing these podcasts and we're trying to be as professional as we possibly can, but it's very challenging because you're at home within your, your area. And I do hear a baby crying in the background, which is really cool. I can hear it. And you know what? Bringing you yeah. back to life. That's amazing. So Andy, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to educate us and again, it's the way of the future. We need to be able to expand and grow to the future. And with your help in Zen5, we appreciate all you do. Thank you so much and great to have you on the show. Thanks, Lori. I hope to see you soon. Absolutely.
Interested in being part of our show or advertising on our podcast? Contact us at info at fifthgenmedia.com for more information. We'd love to be a part of your success.